Thank you all for staying for this afternoon's session because it's 2.45 on St. Patrick's Day Eve, and I know you probably all want to get started. <laughs> so, um, also wanted to thank you for being interested in this topic because, you know, it's a lot of bureaucracy that you have to navigate through, and it's very challenging sometimes. I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and, and where I work, Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation. I'm in the Planning and Recreation Resources Division, which is this sort of a lighter tan area. I guess I can point with this. Um, so I kind of, I'm the State Trails Coordinator 30% of my time, but I also uh, help with master plans for our state parks and also the Virginia Outdoors Plan. We have a trails program and the vision of that trails program is active communities and open space linked by trails and greenways that connect individuals, children, and their families to nature and to each other. So for today, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, basically four areas that are a little disjointed. One is I want you to understand the different planning scales from statewide planning down to local planning down to planning at the parcel level. Also, you want access to more public lands. Sometimes you feel like you aren't getting that permission. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what some of the constraints land managers are under so you can understand their point of view a little bit. And also how you can influence them better to, to listen to your point of view and include you in their designs. Funding is always the elephant in the room, so I'll talk about that a little bit. I don't always have answers for everybody, but Maybe, you know, we can brainstorm together. And then I'm going to end with some fun stuff, which is just, you know, the camp pictures of campgrounds on our state parks that you might want to visit and um, so that you do see that there is positive that comes out of all the work that can be, you know, many, many years long. So at the state level, this is like the two million foot view, okay? We have this Virginia Outdoors Plan. And this was our 2007 plan, and in that plan we identified all of these different statewide trails proposed that we'd like to see developed. And the ones that are skinny are already there, like the Appalachian Trail, and you have Bike Route 76 and Bike Route 1. So this is the Beaches to Bluegrass Trail, which we're getting ready to start a conceptual planning process for. Anybody who's interested in participating in that, please let me know, and you can um, participate in our webinar in April. This is the Great Eastern Trail, which is primarily on U.S. Forest Service land. And um, most of it in Virginia is on multi-purpose trails, so a lot of that trail is open to horseback riders. This is the James River Heritage Trail. We finished the conceptual plan for that um, late in 2011, and I have the little booklets over here, the executive summaries, if anybody's interested in looking at that. That really depends on a lot of private partners to make that kind of connectivity happen, although right now we're using just road networks. This is the East Coast Greenway. That right now is primarily on road, but their eventual goal is to have an off-road path. And this is the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail in Virginia. I mean, it goes all the way up to through three states and the dist District of Columbia. So let me make sure I said what I needed to. Uh, there is a code section that authorizes DCR to, ha to plan for this statewide system of trails. We don't have any money to implement this. We depend on our advocates and our local and what happens at the local level to actually make it happen. And we don't, although we might possibly could use eminent domain in a totally different political environment, we just won't, we won't go there. So regional trail systems. Um, our regional governments are pretty much driven by what the local governments in that region tell them to do. So they're pretty much focused on transportation and economic development and some of those other um, categories. It's kind of the 200-foot scale of planning, but some regional governments in Virginia do have greenways plans. I think one really good example is Roanoke. Um, they have a commission that works together with all the counties and towns and they have a Greenway coordinator, Liz Belcher, many of you may know her. But they also do a great job of promotion. If you go to their RoanokeOutside.com website, you'll find 
um, links to maps and all kinds of things that you can do outside in Roanoke. And um, Roanoke was just named uh, one of the best places to retire by Wall Street Journal. It was voted the best mountain town last fall. And um, I just read in the paper last week that their hotel and lodging has gone up 5.8%. So I'm not claiming there's a direct causal relationship there, but I think there is a relationship at least. Don't, I'm not going to read this to you. <laughs> but I, I do have handouts over here that have some sample text from different local comprehensive plans. This is where it really happens and where you can really play a huge role getting language in your local comprehensive plan that can help. And one of the plans that I wanted to highlight was Culpeper because they actually have language in their plan that says um, their goal is to provide trail facilities which promote horseback riding and walking for primarily recreational purposes. And then they have specific obje objectives linked to that goal. They have maps that identify where those multi-purpose trails are and they, they define multi-purpose trails as including horseback riding. And so you may want to take a look at their language and, and see your local comprehensive plan and compare it. Also at the parcel level, this is down to the 2,000 foot scale, we have uh, an opportunity to comment on plans at this level too generally. These are our state park plans. They're all online, so you can go look at the executive summaries for all these plans. And we do have a lot of equestrian facilities identified in our master plans. We don't necessarily have them built yet, but if there's a, a park near you and you want to go see if, if there's a, uh, an equestrian facility or if you want to suggest that there be added in the next five year updated in an equestrian facility, you can do that. So I just want you to understand that at, at the different levels, there's all different kinds of um, input that you can provide. At the statewide level, it's kind of a policy plan. At the regional level, you know, you want to push the economic development and the promotion, how it's really improving your area. And at the local level, you want that specific language that can stand up in court, you know. And at the parcel level, um, you want to be able to show up at the meetings and, and suggest where you'd like to see your equestrian facility on that specific piece of land. So I've gotten a lot of this information in the last few days from some of the federal land managers. And there's a big difference between federal lands and state lands, local lands, in terms of their um, flexibility with allowing um, different uses, and I'm going to try to explain that a little bit. Also, it's really important that you don't have the bicyclists and the mountain bikers and the hikers and the equestrians all asking for something else. It's nice if you can get together and approach that land manager and ask for the same thing. <clears throat> and if also you need to raise awareness so that you have um, other people in your community at the table to help support your ideas. And take the time to review the do draft documents. I know it's really painful, but it really serves you to, in the long run. Sally. <laughs> I just gave her this big, thick, shared use path document, which is out for public review now, which you can comment on until May 14th. And a shared use path would be something like High Bridge Trail State Park. It could be um, W&O and D Trail, not necessarily a paved trail. So there's different federal agencies, obviously, and they have different missions. And the U.S. Forest Service is, you know, tasked with protecting grasslands and forests. But since grasslands and forests have always had grazing animals, they're much more open to equestrian use. And you can ride equestrians through 1,200 miles of trail in Virginia. And a lot of the forest land itself is open for open riding, although they discourage that. Because if you have more than a few riders, you start to um, damage the resource. In the Mount Rogers National Recreation Area, you have to stay on the trails. The Blue Ridge Parkway is the National Park Service. It was designed as a parkway with lots of intensive landscaping, a lot of attention to views. Um, it is the most visited national park in, in the nation. 
So they're thinking about visitors nationally and internationally. They have millions of visitors a year, and so their idea of protecting the resources is, is a lot different than a state park, which is pulling from you know, maybe a few states in the area. These are some of the Blue Ridge Parkway's access criteria. And since it's the end of the day, I don't really want to read this to you. It goes for four slides. But it is on the handout so that you can um, look at it and refer to it. And I can't really answer questions on this because, like I said, I'm a state employee. But they were willing to send me this access criteria so that you all would be able to negotiate with them. And they especially wanted me to point out that you can get a permit for certain activities and you can get a commercial youth use authorization. So, you know, those are things you might also want to explore. So DCR's mission, let me just, I want to go back one second. The mission of the National Park Service is to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and wildlife to provide for the enjoyment that leaves them unimpaired for future generations. In our mission statement, you know, you can see that the public is really coming first in that. Um, so there's a little difference there in, in the mission. This is High Bridge Trail State Park by the way. So in DCR master plans, we're looking at site suitability. And this is something I encourage you all, if you want to suggest a trail on a piece of property, to think about doing some investigative work before you ask where it's located. This is the web soil survey that's online. And anybody can go to this online source and you know draw a little polygon around the area they want to study and then bring up different types of soil suitability, and we're looking at camp areas, off-road motorcycle trails, because they didn't have equestrian trails, so I was trying to find something that was at least, you know, worse so that you, in terms of impact, so that you could um, start somewhere. These, it's like a stoplight. Red is areas you don't want to use, yellow is maybe okay, and green is the ideal location. This particular site is on the York River in the Middle Peninsula, so it's a lot of wetlands areas. And you can see that it, there's not a lot of suitable land for, for putting trails in. Well, this particular website is available for anybody to use. We um, can use this when we're doing our state park master plans to get an idea of suitable locations for different types of facilities that we want to put in to the park. That's one of the things we look at. We're also looking at topography, slopes, wetlands, hydrology, and the, where the floodplain is, because you, you know, you're limited to the development there. Um, road access, what's already there. What are the vegetation and ecological resources, and what are the historical resources? So we're really looking at the site very carefully as we plan our parks. I just grabbed a, a piece of property on the York River in the Middle Peninsula. Oh, it's the web, it's the web so, soil, sorry, web soil survey. And it's a little, it takes a little while to figure it out, but if I can do it, anybody can do it. So another thing I wanted to mention was crime prevention through environment. Environmental Design, SEPTED is the acronym for that. And this is something else that land managers are thinking about. Natural surveillance is they want to increase the perception that people can see what's going on. So at trailheads where you may have kids come park and party, uh, you might want to have some type of officer driving by and, and to be able to see into that site you know, fairly regular on a regular basis so that people know they're going to be watched. Natural access control is the idea of clearly differentiating between what's public land and what's private land so that people don't wander onto private property. And that's accomplished through landscaping and fencing, um, signs, uh, 
real clear entrances and exits to facilities. And sometimes when people are opposed to you riding onto a trail and creating like a social trail to connect to it, it has to do with that access control. Territorial enforcement is people who live along the trail taking pride in their property and actually helping to police and make sure that their stuff is protected. And we see a lot of that in our state parks. People take a real interest and they call the um, law enforcement person if they see any problem and that really helps us out. Other septed elements, maintenance, and that's the broken window theory. If you don't fix that broken window, kids will come back and break all the windows. So keep up with your maintenance, keep the vandalism um, painted over. Activity support, you want people to think there's programs going on, people coming out and using that property. So that, you, know, you might put a sign up that says children playing or you know, whatever, or have programs that are actually getting people out there and using that park. So these are the, some of the resources that we use for our equestrian design. We have the Greenways and Trails Toolbox, which was that first slide that I showed you. We have our campground manual that our design and construction section uses, uh, a DCR trail development and management manual. And the, these other um, ones, of course, the Forest Service one that's in your, pa in your packet. That was great that they gave you books for everybody. And then um, this book by Jean, Jean Wood um, for really wildland areas. It's a very great resource. So your asks should align with the mission of the federal agency or state agency and with the resource capabilities of that site. And also remember, you have strength in numbers, but you also have impacts in numbers. So finally, we get to the funding piece. Um, there aren't a lot, there isn't a lot of money for trails. The Recreational Trails Program could have been easily cut by the governor this year through the MAP 21, the new uh, transportation program. Uh, it's, it comes off the top of the transportation money for transport, what used to be transportation enhancements, but is now called transportation alternatives and the governor can sign in or not sign into that program. It's always pretty limited, around a million dollars of a year to, to spread statewide. There's this virginiaservice.org. If you're doing a lot with your property that might be you know, serving veterans or children, um, what I know is that <clears throat> it's a partnership of the tractor Supply and the American Quarter Horse Association. Does anybody want to talk about that that might know a little bit more about it? <laughs> okay. Um, these are some of the criteria that I just took off the website. I haven't actually been involved with this grant program at all. This is another one grant programs for equine nonprofits, uh, the USA Equestrian Trust, and the deadline is May 6th if you are interested in pursuing something here, and, it, and it's a need-based, but they're looking for national level type projects. What was the one before? STEP, Stewards for Trails, Education and Partnerships. And is this local or is this national? It's a national one. I have some information on it from an email that was forwarded to me, so I'll be glad to give it to you if you want it. So other approaches, and all trail users are looking at everything they can these days. 
Um, even though, you know, in our Virginia Outdoors survey, trails were number one in all the regions, public input, we want trails and connectivity. Uh, resources are shrinking and shrinking, so we got to be creative. And crowdfunding is just, the, you know, they have these websites now through social media where you can put an idea out there and get it what they call crowdfunded. Um, and there's lots of different examples of websites that do that, and I'll be glad to share some with people if they're interested. That's how correct. Do you change that? I mean, how, you know, I'd almost like to see this part of that template. That's why I asked the question about the laws. You know? I would too. And in fact, when we did our Virginia Outdoor Survey, we asked that specific question. Mm -hmm. And there was support for spending public money for easements if public access was allowed. Yeah. Um, And a lot of times the public landowner wants to see, you know, a state park person, enforce, you know, a law enforcement officer yep. there, or they want to see the property monitored. Right. Sometimes if you have a strong uh, organization that will, you know, talk to the landowner and say, we're going to monitor your property and let's have, a, you know, an agreement in writing or something like that, you can talk them into it. Um, it's very challenging. I do think there are could be more done at the legislative level to help push that along, but I don't have the solutions for you. And if there were a land trust developed that were really focused on equestrian riding, you know, in some places the land trusts are focused on that, and they and they don't take easements unless those provisions are in there. Oh. So, What's an example of that? <sighs> there's one out west, and I can't think of the name, but I can That's find it. One. There's one in um, New England that isn't necessarily for equestrian, but is a land trust for conserving all the rail trails as they become available, because the, often the state won't have the money to pounce on those. Yeah. Um, Mm-hmm. And if anybody's interested in, in what I know, you know, in, in looking into that more, contact me. My cards are up here, and I can send you the information I have. At least not to my, you know, <clears throat> that isn't my specific expertise, but I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, we kind of skipped over the development community, but they can be a real partner, you know, if, especially if it's uh, a, an equestrian development. So don't forget to talk to those people if you know them. Who benefits? Look at that, because that can be your funding partner if you go talk to somebody and say, look, we buy all this from you and can maybe you give a little back and who will partner think about those things when you're looking for money so at the local level we mentioned the local plans um, you've done the work you've actually gotten the wording in your comprehensive plan now it comes down to the county doing their budget um, and they're gonna say <clears throat> if you offer half of this we'll do it and Carol might be able to fill you in on the, some of the challenges she's had in Falk here with that. But if you have a local group that has some capacity and you can come up with matching money, a lot of times that's what it takes to get in your budget. Also, um, in-kind can be another way of matching. 
So track your volunteer hours. Some organizations do this a lot better than others. The Appalachian Trail tracks their volunteer hours very well. The Roanoke Region does a good job too, the Roanoke Greenways Commission. So you might look at some of those models. As I mentioned before, for, for a lot of landowners, they want to know that there's going to be ongoing monitoring and maintenance, so that might be something that your group has to develop the capacity to offer. If, another way to do it is sponsor events that help the community. You know, you can really get some uh, social capital if you offer some rides for veterans or, you know, some, some children who would never have the opportunity to get on a horse, have the opportunity through your organization and make businesses aware of your spending power. You know, when you have some of these events, tell your people who attend, you know, when they stop at the restaurant, say why they're in town so people understand that connection and stay positive and optimistic because it's so much easier to work with government folks if you have that kind of approach. So getting into the state budget, and I really don't understand it too well. Sally probably understands this a lot better than me and might want to comment. But right now, we don't have any bond issues out for our state parks. We've spent the money from our 2002 bond. So that if there were another one, that would be an opportunity to develop some more facilities. Um, also, there's state park operating funds that get approved. And we just got some operating funds to open up Powhatan State Park this summer. And then, there, of course, you have the option of asking for line items in the, in the General Assembly's budget. Challenging, but did you want to add anything to that, Sally? No. <laughs> OK. So now we get to the fun stuff. Um, thank you for your patience as I went through that, because I know a lot of it was very dry. There's equestrian trails at 19 of our state parks. You can rent horses at New River, and there's campgrounds at all these parks that I'm going to go through now or just quickly with some pictures. And that's not in the state park brochure that you're looking at. It doesn't tell you where the equestrian campgrounds are. They left that out. So just as a takeaway to summarize what I was saying before, I should have had the slide before the other one. The people that I've seen who've been really successful, like Sally, uh, very creative, positive, and, and I re mean relentless in a, in a positive way here of just not giving up. You know, it takes years. You get diverted and you, you, know, you figure out another way around the obstacle. And, and then offering something in return, I can't stress enough how important that is. So this is our facility for riders at the New River Trail State Park. We have a bunch of these shows going on this year. This is the beautiful trail by the New River. This just shows you, I mean, it's a 57-mile trail. So this is the New River here. This is 81 and Interstate 77. There's all these little camp um, cabins that have developed along the, the uh, trail. And this is the actual, this is showing you the New River itself because a lot of people will use that blue way. But the trail itself is, is on this section. It goes here to Galax, goes here to Freeze, and then up to Pulaski. Grayson Highlands, some of our facilities there. This is a beautiful park, Grayson Highland. Plus you have the wild ponies to look at. Fairy Stone, I didn't have a picture of their equestrian camp, which is just opened right down here, but you can see the trail. It's in the sort of the corner of Henry and Franklin. Um, I believe this is in Henry County. And right not far away is Philpot. And also you have a wildlife management area. Where a lot of people will ride onto there somehow. I don't know how. There's not an official trail, but apparently it's done. Not a huge amount here. But I think with the, do you know anything about the adjacent trails and? Uh, if there appear to be informal trails, the, 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 
they ride up, what I understand is they ride up 57 along the side of the shoulder of 57, the wildlife management area. This is Okanichi State Park. We have uh, the Corps of Engineers property all along the river, so um, the trail extends well beyond the park there. Stanton River, similar situation. And this is just opened. And this has a nice uh, picnic facility for the equestrians. And also a bathhouse at the equestrian camp. Is that right? Okay. James River? That's one of your favorites, right? Doubt that I also didn't have a picture of their equestrian campground, but what I wanted to point out to you here, there's the park. Well, here's the Allegheny Highlands Horse Trail that the Forest Service has. So you can ride all over the place. Doubt it? Um, 64 West. See, here's the James River. And there's 64 West. High Bridge Trail, I pointed out that aerial photo to you earlier, and this is the, some of the people riding the trail and actually taking the horses across the bridge. I wasn't sure that would... <laughs> <laughs> and we are planning an equestrian campground there. It is in the master plan. I don't know when we'll get the money to develop it. Well, um, this is the trail itself, showing you that it goes from Pamplin City to Burkeville. We're making, there was like a mile outside of each town that the railroad didn't give us the property for, so we're acquiring that land now to make those connections. It goes through the town of Farmville. But what I wanted to point out in this slide is if you go to the area and stay for a couple of days, there's also the Briary Creek Wildlife Management Area. Holiday Lake State Park, and all those brown lines or trails through there, although I'm not sure what's equestrian and what isn't. Do you know? Yes. Uh, the Holiday Lake is actually one of the smaller state parks, but it's surrounded by a uh, state forest. And that's the trails that we would ride along the state forest property. This is Twin Lakes. Will this be part of the uh, Virginia, what is it, Beaches? Uh, this is too far north. The Tobacco Heritage Trail is part, and they're talking about making a connection from that. It doesn't stop that far away so that it could eventually connect, but it, it might be a spur and it won't be part of the trail itself. Well, they own, I think, over 100 uh, miles of corridor, but they're <laughs> developing the trail as they can as they can manage you know with not very uh, very few staff so I think seven miles is open and they're opening the 17 miles very soon um, and that's about as much information as I have for you at the moment Sandra Tanner if you know Sandra she she's sort of the It takes a long, long time. And that's why I keep emphasizing how important it is to, to, you know, to be patient and to keep moving forward. Because, for instance, if you're trying to get a trail on federal land, they have to go through the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, which takes probably two years just for that study, which is, um, so they, they don't even plan for anything that, you know, really takes it takes five years, they say, is a starting point. The state doesn't have to comply with NEPA. Um, well, we have to, 
we have to in some ways. We don't to the same level that they do. Um, and we do do a lot of the same kinds of studies like I showed you. Um, it just doesn't take as long. It still takes 18 months to do our master planning process, though. And once we have it in the master plan, we don't know when it's going to get funded. It could be 15 years out. So you all know about this site, I guess, because Sally Angier is the one who did all the work to, well, maybe not all the work. I better let her talk about it. But you, you have all the different um, PDFs to the different sections of Virginia and the trails you can ride on this Virginia outdoors.com website, which is the Virginia Association of Parks. Um, and you can search under a lot of different other activities, too, on this site. And if you want to stay informed with our grant announcements, our calendar activities, I do an e-newsletter uh, quarterly. Give me your email address, and I'll be glad to send you our e-news. The last one is going to be um, the last week of March, I'll issue the spring issue. And I'm also very open to content. If you have a trail that you've just opened or um, some calendar items, send them my way. That's my contact information, and I will gladly try to answer your questions. Oh, I've got a question. Okay. Um, we talked about Successful locally grassroots uh, organized and funded uh, trail connections that occurred between some of the or any of the sections of the state sponsored trails. Well, the statewide trails um, are fairly, that was 2007. That, that was captured in the plan. There are all kinds of segments being built along the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail because that had been going on for a long time before we you know, acknowledged it. I've seen designated sections along the East Coast Greenway in the last five years. Um, James River Heritage Trail is still sort of in the concept phase and we haven't developed the designation process yet, but there are trails being opened along the James River that I think will become part of that. Um, and the Great Eastern Trail has made lots of progress. They've signed an MOU for service in February, so they're like official now. And, uh, Do they have a website for their Great Eastern Trail? Yes, Great Eastern Trail Association. And when you look at the website, it's primarily a hiking trail in some of the other states. Don't let that put you off because in Virginia, it's on a lot of multi purpose trails and for service. You had a question I almost pointed at you. Yeah. <laughs> what, uh, what really is the deciding factor whether a state park is going to have uh, overnight camping on a question? Like Lake Anna has camping, but not if you're a horse, you're not with your horse. The you James River does. York River State Park has beautiful trails, but no camping. So it kind of makes Well, I haven't been involved with those mass plan updates specifically, so I couldn't. I can tell you generally, it's probably due to site constraints. Sally, do you know more since you were involved in that? Well, was on, uh, I know about Lake Anna, it is in the master plan. And it was in the master plan the last time it was reviewed, which I want to say was maybe two years ago. The question is, when will it get funded? So we're going to the state legislature to help us fund. If we know what the economy is, well, recreational things are not a high priority. Well, I, I made a comment about that the State Park and Yeah, and I was actually involved in that one too. Um, that since Law and I were both consulted on the original site for the equestrian camp that the Law and was approved after 2002, and the site was not appropriate for us. There was an additional land acquisition there that was going to provide us with a much better place, and we felt that was, for us, we needed to wait until that could play out. Um, again, when the, when the governor is prioritizing bond projects, because they take place over a long time, they're approved in 2002, but it took 10 years to fully fund them all. They're looking at the most bang for the buck to be done first. Um, so those things which were revenue, bigger revenue 
explain to me were the projects which were made higher priority and were done in the earlier years. If you all appreciate that. It is a good thing to come to that and see what if you do. It's going to take a long time to get those camps, but I think we're all really pleased to have them. Um, I think we look forward to one at Lake Anna. I don't know if York River has enough trail there to make it interesting enough for somebody to want to stay in the mind. And, and I think that's one of the things we have to look at. You know, if it's only six miles of trail, is that worth putting in a multi million dollar campground? Their, their trails are up the back trails, up the back, up the back. So that's that a lot of horsemen don't like that. Right. right. So we like kind of look at the whole package, you know, does is this something that fits? So for example, the Palatine State Park, which will open the summer. Now it's not gonna initially be there, but one of the things we put into the master plan was there my camping, we permit a camping there. But it may take seven or eight years to get that funded and fully realized. Um, but we're long but you know, it's all of the long range planning because it takes a long time to get those things into the state budget. And um, it's been fully funded. Where is that state park? Is it in relation to Belmont? Uh, it's about like two properties away. Really? That's all? All of those are. So that's another thing we want to look at is how, oh, how can we develop facilities there that actually enhance you know, what she's trying to do. And that's an opportunity for an adjacent landowner in the river, you know, to really develop a nice campground and have some connection to the park. Did we get the land at Lake Anna that you were? Uh, the, the land is there for Lake Anna. It's just it, it's in the master plan. It's a matter of it being funded eventually. It's part of you know, a lot of long range planning goes into that master plan, and there's other things to be funded. But I think the other important thing is that you know you don't have to rely totally on the to provide those opportunities for people in the community who could also be doing things with private enterprise. So maybe where River doesn't have the amount of trails that are going to support an equestrian camp, but maybe there's a horseman in that community who's close enough who would like to provide some overnight accommodations. So I think there's business opportunities there as well that maybe <coughs> are being fully explored or, or realize. I and mean, I think the parks are really good about working with private And the other thing, go back to some of Jennifer's earlier comments that, that I would say, and I've had the opportunity to be on uh, one of her committees on the State Watch Trails plan, is that it's really important to, to be aware of this plan. And if that conceptual trail runs through your county, it's up to us to go to the county and say, we want to make sure that you're thinking about this and you're writing it into your comp plan. For example, when my county was doing the master plan, you know, nobody was even aware that the James River Heritage Trail had been a concept in the, in the state outdoors plan for like 30 years. And there were two counties, I think, that actually had some piece of it that they'd actually visioned and had implemented. I think it was a great bunch of them. Sally's the one who did the audit and looked through all the comp plans of all the counties along the James River to see who actually had language. Because it was <laughs> like, actually was from the birds. So, you know, we do, it is important for us to take some ownership of what's going to happen in our own communities and make sure that, that we're making them aware that it's important for us to get those things written into our comp plans. And maybe nothing's going to happen, but when a developer comes along and they pick up the property that's along that corridor, then it's easier to help to negotiate with that developer to please leave this with a plan or trail corridor available. You know, maybe the rest of the trail will come together for years, but if they don't allocate that space in the beginning, then it's never going to happen because somebody's going to build a house on it. You said that so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sally. <laughs> That's not just among yourselves, but outside. And we'd have no statewide, you know, coalition. 
looking, asking for these things at the state level. So, of, of the mountain bikers and the horseback riders and the bicyclists and the walkers, and there really are a lot of people out there who could be pulled together. 